All right. Uh, so uh, last week we talked about uh, some introductions to R. We talked about some basic R coding stuff and R markdown. Uh, and uh, uh, so I mentioned that we're not really trying to make you into programming masters in this class or anything like that. Uh, but what we are trying to do uh, is trying to get you familiar with two things, right? We're trying to get you to the point where you can clean data. Uh, which we're going to be doing with the dplyr package, and we're going to be doing data visualization, which we're going to be doing with the ggplot2 package. And so we're going to start this week by looking at data cleaning, uh, which is mostly going to be done in dplyr, um, but of course, um, some things uh, just regular R as well. Uh, and uh, so that's what we're going to be focusing on. Um, and now I will say this is if you're not if you're not already into coding, uh, this is not going to be the most fun you're ever going to have. I'm just going to admit that right up front. But it is absolutely necessary. Uh, it's pretty much impossible to work with data on any sort of scale if you don't know how to manipulate that data into the form that you want it to be and clean it and prepare it uh, for use. It's just not going to happen. Uh, you know, you've been in a classroom environment up to now where professors have provided you with data sets that are typically pre-cleaned and just ready to go. That is not how the real world works. Uh, it is entirely possible that if you go on and get a job in some sort of field where you are working with data, that this week of class will be the most valuable thing you ever did in your college experience. Uh, however, that does not necessarily mean that it's going to be fun. This is, it's cleaning. We're, we're learning how to clean, right? Do you like cleaning your bathroom? Probably not, but it's important that you know how to do it, right? Um, and so that's what we're going to be doing. So uh, data wrangling is the process of going from raw data to something usable. Uh, it's what you're going to spend most of your time on as a data person. Uh, so you better be good at it. And something this is something that surprises a lot of people when you start working on data projects. You think, ah, I'm going to spend all my time, you know, tuning models, picking analyses, you know, setting up things, drawing insights, all this sort of stuff. No, that stuff takes you very little time, at least once you get used to knowing how to do it. What takes you a lot of time, what you actually spend most of your time doing is preparing the data for use. This is what you spend most of your time doing. So you better be good at it. Uh, the better you are at it, the fewer errors you're going to make, which is you don't want to make errors. Uh, also, the less time you're going to have to spend going back and fixing those errors and the faster you're going to be. And so you're going to spend less time doing this and more on the perhaps more interesting stuff. Uh, this is data communications. So this is part of data communications, right? Uh, I mean, sorry. Um, uh, in the sense that it's something that you have to do when you're working with data, which data communications is a part of that. Um, however, this also would apply equally to every other data class that you've taken. Uh, it's just that, you know, actually spending time on this material does not make as much sense in some other courses. Like I said, this is sort of a mishmash class, so we're going to cover it here. Uh, they don't cover enough, I think, so I'm definitely going to spend uh, all week covering it here, and we'll be coming back to these skills throughout the term. I mean, because we're going to be working with data, you're going to have to do it. So what are we doing this week? Uh, we're going to be talking about the goal of data wrangling, a lot of the concepts behind data wrangling, how we can think about what we are doing. Um, and uh, those things are going to cover across all different sorts of languages, right? You're not necessarily always going to be working in R, but most of the stuff that we're going to cover in this week even, aside from the technical details of like what line of code are you writing, the concepts are going to be the same from language to language. And you can take a lot of what you're learning here uh, and apply it, say, in Pandas, in Python or something like that. Um, and so the, the concepts are all the same. And in fact, um, this is a, this video is adapted from a workshop that I did a little while ago, a couple of years ago, about data wrangling uh, using dplyr and the tidyverse. Uh, there's a whole video of it there uh, you can link to. Um, and I also did the exact same workshop video with data table, which is a different R package for cleaning data. That's uh, good for really big data sets and extra speed, um, which actually is what I use most of the time on a day-to-day -day basis these days. Uh, I also did the exact same project uh, workshop in Python, in Pandas. And I didn't change the slides. I just changed the code that was on the slides. The concepts here translate from language to language and package to package. So we're going to be talking about how to think about data wrangling. We're also going to be going through some technical tips for data wrangling, specifically in the tidyverse. So we are going to cover code as well. All right. Um, a quick technical note uh, before we get too deep into any of this. Um, one thing to talk about is the pipe. So tidyverse is, is designed around the pipe. And what the pipe is, is it looks like this. Uh, and it's a percent, and then a greater than, and then another percent. Uh, you can also, in, in newer versions of R, you can write it differently. You can also write it like uh, this, with a bar, and then like that. Uh, this is the, uh, the base R version of the pipe. Uh, the percent version is the tidyverse version. It's been around for longer. Um, and uh, I'm going to be using a lot in our data cleaning, because uh, it is commonly used with uh, with tidyverse stuff. And what it does is it sort of allows you to rewrite code in such a way that you don't have so many like nested complex statements to read. Like, for example, let's take a look at this code right here. Um, what this code does is this takes the average of a variable uh, and then writes it out as a percentage. All right, so it's a zero-one variable, writes out the proportion, uh, rounded to one 
uh, decimal place. Now this is hard to read, right? How can I how can I figure out what this line of code is doing? So I have to think. I have to first of all read it from the inside out. I have to say, okay, I'm taking the empty cars data. I'm taking out the am variable. I'm gonna take the mean of that while setting the missing uh, while dropping any missing values, and then I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna send that to my scales percent function uh, with an accuracy setting. Right, so that's hard to read. If you read this cookie line of code, it'd be hard to figure out what was going on with it. Uh, and also, um, it's very easy to make mistakes and errors, like to drop a parenthesis somewhere and not know why your code is not working. The pipe, however, what it does is it's like a conveyor belt system. Uh, it says, hey, I'm gonna take an object, and I'm gonna pass it along to the next function and make it the first argument of the next function, right? So this allows you to sort of space out your commands line by line rather than nesting them all together. So this exact same line of code can be rewritten like this. I'm gonna take my empty cars data, I'm gonna send it to the poll function, which takes a variable out. We'll talk about that function a bit later. I'm gonna take, so now I'm, so now I've taken my data set, I've pulled out a variable, now I'm working with a variable. I'm gonna take that variable, I'm gonna pass that along to the mean function, so I can take the mean. Now I'm working with a single value, the mean. I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna pass that along the conveyor belt to my percentage, my, my percent function, and then format it as a percentage, all right? It's like a conveyor belt, we can easily see as we go from step to step, here's the data, I'm gonna pull out the variable, take the mean of it, convert that mean into a, into a text percentage. Um, and uh, uh, so it becomes a lot easier to read, a lot easier to follow exactly what it is that you're doing, also a lot easier to avoid errors in terms of closing those parentheses uh, and finding where the errors are if they happen. So we are gonna be using this pipe quite a bit. All right, so there are some limitations in what we're going to go over as well. We only have so much time. Uh, I'm not going to be going into, in, so I'm not going to go into super great detail on a lot of the technical commands. I'm going to show you what they are. I'm going to give you some examples of how they can be used. Um, and then I'm going to sort of leave it to you to, if you then going to use them, walk through carefully, make sure that you are uh, using them properly, check the help files, all this sort of thing. Uh, and in my, my view with computer skills being taught in a classroom environment is that my comparative advantage uh, is letting you know what's out there, is to sort of let you know what to look at. Uh, and really, to really know how to use this stuff, I'm, you know, even if I described a single command in great detail, that would not really help you quite as much as just having you actually do it. So the real learning is going to come from practice and from Googling. So take what you see here today, find yourself a project and do it. Clean some data. And we'll be doing that in one of our homework assignments as well. Um, you're going to have a terrible time the first time that you do it. Uh, the process of cleaning data, especially when you haven't done it before, is almost always going to be banging your head against a wall, wondering why the line of code that you wrote doesn't work properly. This is a universal thing. There's no amount of teaching that I can do to get you around that. Um, so it's just going to be a, ca a case of being willing to take a, da a dive into that project and uh, spend some time on it until you can get it right. Because once you've done the first one, the second one is going to be a lot easier. All right, uh, so we have laid out what we are planning to do in these videos. Uh, and so in the next video, we will start doing it. I'm going to start talk, talk, talking about the, the concepts of what we're doing with DataRing.